Welcome to the Mammoth Keeper Show, episode number three. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about salary negotiations, income inequality, early retirement failure, NAFTA 2.0, Adam Smith versus early retirement extreme, and Sis, good news. We're going to be talking about some good news today, guys. All that and more in today's episode of the Mad McKeever Show. Let's just get into it. The first item I want to discuss with you guys today was a Reddit post. And this Reddit post was best website to reference during a salary negotiation. I'm trying to figure out potential Android developer salary in Toronto. See this post for my specific situation. The company itself doesn't have a glass door profile, so I can't use company specific salary. And then the poster goes on to share the usual suspects. Uh, websites like glassdoor.com, payscale.com, and nouveau.ca. And so, first of all, if you're currently in a salary negotiation, you're trying to figure out what market salary would be for your position in your market, these, these three websites are probably three of the best websites you can check out. So again, there'll be a link to this article as well as all the articles we discussed today in the video description down below. So just click that video description, you can find the links, check out those websites if you're in the middle of a salary negotiation yourself. This is a situation all of us find ourselves in at one point or another. Now, I think probably something like being a developer, an Android senior developer, probably has a much wider range and pay scale than say something like a senior accountant, something that I would have experienced myself. However, it can still vary drastically depending on your city, your market, the exact title, the company. And so that's where websites like Payscale and Glassdoor are extremely helpful just to give you a broad range so you at least know if you're in the right ballpark. Beyond that, one of my suggestions or recommendations would be lean on your personal network. You probably went to school with a ton of other individuals that are working in similar fields. So reach out to them, find out what are they getting paid, where do they work, all that great stuff, and build up that anecdotal comps as well in addition to using the market the generalities from the market from websites like Glassdoor and Payscale. Another resource I think a lot of people overlook is their trade organization. So if you belong to a trade organization or a professional organization, for myself that would be you know being a CPA. Uh, usually those organizations will produce their own pay studies, their own pay scales. And so uh, again, it's not perfect, but it's going to give you a range. And so I think that's something you need to realize with almost any of these salary negotiations, unless you're working for a massive organization with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of employees, it's going to be hard to really narrow in on exactly what you should be getting paid for that exact position. However, having a wide range is important and then figuring out where your skill sets fit into that range. And beyond that, one thing to be hyper aware of and it's something I know myself and a lot of introverts I think fail to do is realize that it's not just about your skills, it's about your actual ability to negotiate. So it's not just enough to know the salary range, it's not just enough to have the skill set you also need to be able to interact with people. You need to be able to convey your value, the value proposition you're making to that organization for why they should pay you, say at the top end of the range, if that's where you're aiming. And I mean like, why not aim for the top of the range? The second thing I wanted to bring to your attention was also another Reddit post. And this one on a completely different subject though, this was in the Personal Finance Canada section as well. It's titled, Those of us who care about combating income inequality, how can we possibly justify equality of outcome? I don't really even want to get into this post. It just more sparked a conversation I wanted to have with you guys and I'd love to get your opinion, your feedback on it as well. Equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome. And far too often I see people conflating the two. Well, I do understand the argument that some people will make that they're the same thing because in order to have equality of opportunity, you have to have equality of outcome. I, I don't really buy into that. I don't think a lot of people buy into that thought process, but I just want to real quickly highlight it for you guys, at least share my perspective on it. So equality of opportunity is that we all get the right to become that thing, to try that thing, to, you know, take that chance, that risk, that whatever. Whereas equality of outcome is everyone gets a medal, everyone gets a prize. Equality of opportunity really comes down to you're on a relatively even playing field, it, but it's still gonna be a meritocracy. It's still gonna be the best of the best get to rise to the top. Whereas equality of outcome is we all get medals, we all get to be astronauts if we want to so be. 
Okay, so I'm being a little facetious with my explanations here. However, if you want to understand the difference between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome, I highly recommend you read on more because I, I just far too often find people conflating the two, misrepresenting the two, and just misunderstanding a lot of the subject matter. I think it's really important. Equality of opportunity is something noble and desirable, I think. Equality of outcome is something dangerous that caused tens of millions of people to die. Look at the USSR and communism. Switching gears and switching over to the Mr. Money Mustache Forum, there's a post I want to focus on for you guys called Retired Early, It's Not Working Out. First of all, this is not clickbait, and I think this is a great, great conversation that got sparked here. And so I'm just going to read Randy's original post for you. I stuck to the plan paid off all my debt, saved enough to retire and live on the investment. There's one small problem though. I saved enough to live on cheap overseas. I'm desperate for intellectual stimulation and a community of people who speak English. My question's to you, the much wiser and less naive mustachians. Do I come back to the US and get a regular stressful job until I've saved enough to be independent in America? Do I take the risk to start a business since I'm not beholden to location or expense? Any other ideas, starting from zero here, but at least I'm not in the negative. And so this is a great post. Like all the posts we'll be discussing today, there's a link in that video description down below. So click there, check it out if you want to get deeper into this subject matter. But essentially what I want to lay out for you is it's a problem I constantly see both people experiencing online as well as a lot of the nay naysayers or haters bring up in regards to early retirement and financial independence. And that is, you plan for one thing, you execute on that plan, but then things may change. You may have lifestyle inflation, you may have unexpected health consequences come up, unexpected health expenses, all that stuff. I get it. The, the thing is, I think far too many people are framing financial independence retired early as this extremely binary thing. You flip a switch and now you're financially independent, you're retired early, and you will never work again. You will never be productive, you will never earn another penny. Whereas, that's really the only struggle I have with the financial independence retired early community is our, some of our nomenclature, some of our branding. And so that's where things like firepreneurship, I think, kind of fill that gap. And to me, what firepreneurship is all about is the idea that you get to financially independent, you get to retire early, you get to just enough, and then you can go take those interesting risks and experiment. And the thing is, the way our economy works, the way our society works, the way really any capitalistic framework is going to work, if you're productive, if you're adding value to society, you're probably going to receive some of that value back. And so that value could be monetarily informed, that could be through favors, social capital, whatever. But again, it's very unlikely that you're going to get to financial independence, retire early at a young age, and not be able to be productive in society one way or another. So it's something that myself, that I've discussed on my channel, this idea that I plan to live a certain lifestyle, and then what if you wanted something fancier? And to me, it really just comes about becoming conscious of that consumption. So as long as you're conscious of the consumption, that's all that really matters in my perspective. And that's what really our guiding principle of financial independence, retired early, or early retirement extreme is all about, is conscious consumption. It's not no consumption. It's conscious consumption. It's being very aware. Is this really adding value to your life? And for, so for this individual, for Rainey, who posted here, it sounds like moving back to America would add net value to their life. So I'd recommend they do it. However, again, it's not like you need to go back and become a wage slave immediately and have to work five years nose the grindstone. You can maybe experiment with things like semi-fire or you know mini retirements, all types of other options in order to create a better balance, a better lifestyle for yourself. And it's going, it's a very personal subject matter. It's going to be very individual specific. So each of us is going to have our own experiences. But anyways, I just thought it was a great question and a subject matter that comes up a lot on my YouTube channel. So I want to share with you guys. If you want to learn more, jump in that video description and you'll find links to the Mr. My Mustache forum post. Otherwise, I'd love to get your opinion though. Jump in those comment sections and let me know. Are you going to approach financial independence as binary? Will you either be working and wage slave or will you be early retired financially independent or are you going to be like a lot of us in that gray area where 
hey, sometimes you're maybe working technically, sometimes you're not, and it's a very fluid proposition where the key is that you're having fun and being conscious of your consumption. Let me know in the comment section down below. Now, a big subject matter I wanna discuss with you guys, and it's too big for me to discuss just on the show, but I just wanna bring it to your attention, is this idea of NAFTA 2.0. And so if you're not familiar with what NAFTA was, it was the North American Free Trade Agreement. And at the time, it was this revolutionary agreement where Canada, the US, and Mexico got together, and essentially we decided not to be dicks to each other and not tear up the shit out of each other's products. The thing is, minor libertarian, I love that. I love any free trade agreement. You know, NAFTA wasn't perfect. Uh, I, I don't think that there's been too many perfect trade agreements in the past, and that's because still far too often we're beholden to certain sacred cows. In particular with NAFTA, one of the sacred cows that we as Canadians had, I'll find the exact link to and share with you guys, but this idea that dairy and chicken and the supply chain management that we have in there, that that's somehow extremely culturally relevant to Canadians, and that because we kind of prop up or support our dairy and chicken industry, that our trade agreements with the US and Mexico had to uh, recognize that and the pricing kind of structures that those supply management uh, organizations implement. Each of the NAFTA members all had their own sacred cow, so it's not like I'm only attacking Canada. But one of the big things that came up is that Mexico and Canada are not presenting a united front to Donald Trump, to the Americans. And so that's caused a lot of controversy here in Canada. And so at first, you know, a lot of Canadians pointed the finger at Mexico, then Mexico, because Mexico essentially started negotiating directly with the US and not collaborating with Canada in negotiations with the US. However, Mexico pointed back to the fact that uh, Canada had started negotiating automotively with the US without Mexico's consent or warning. So it's, it's a messy, he said, he said, he said, sort of situation. What, what I really want to discuss, and I'm gonna to link to some National Post articles or some Financial Post articles you guys can check out. I highly recommend you read at least a little bit on the subject matter so you kind of have an idea of what's going on. You know, there's, there's a lot of moving parts to this. I'm not gonna be able to cover it all in such a short video. But the thing is, free trade overall is good. Protectionism, tariffs, supply management, like all this stuff, ends up taking away power from the consumer, it ends up taking away our, our agency as individuals, and that's what I find highly concerning. And realistically, it seems like NAFTA 2.0 probably won't be the perfect trade agreement. Certainly it won't be a libertarian's perfect trade agreement. Certainly it won't be a perfect trade agreement for Canada. But something that's interesting is the narrative that's being presented in Canadian media has changed drastically. So originally it was like, you know, we're gonna stick it to Trump, like screw him and his tariffs, we're gonna negotiate hard. Then once Mexico kind of didn't present that uh, combined united front, all of a sudden it became candidates need to be able to take what they can take. And that's unfortunate. And it's interesting, these articles all discuss all these kind of like little niche industries you'd never expect, like the American wine industry. And if NAFTA doesn't end up, you know, allowing us to trade wine, then like it's going to destroy the American wine market because Canada is now the largest importer of American wines. And again, this we can find millions, I bet millions of examples of different little niche industries that are going to be drastically impacted by these changes to NAFTA or by tariffs if we start implementing more and more tariffs against each other. At the end of the day, you know, not allowing for free flow of goods, information, or people, that's, that's never a good thing in my mind. Governments should always be promoting free flow of goods, services, people, ideas, all that great stuff. If you're not allowing the free flow of the, those things, I have to question, it sounds like you're kind of a big brother. It kind of sounds like you're looking out for us for our own good. It kind of sounds like you don't think that we should have agency over ourselves. Just my thoughts though, I'd love to get your opinions. What, what are your thoughts about NAFTA and all the craziness going on? Jump in the comment section down below. And one thing we didn't even discuss was the fact that the focus that uh, NAFTA 2.0 become more focused on the chapters on gender and indigenous rights and a reformed and more transparent investor state dispute settlements. I, there's there's so much going on here, guys. I, I, I feel like I did a disservice by not almost just doing a whole separate video on NAFTA. Regrets, we all got them. I'd love to know though, jump in that comment section, share your thoughts on NAFTA, and please share your facts, share your sources so that we can all become more informed. Now, a really interesting post that happened in the early retirement extreme forums that I wanna share with you guys essentially was titled, Adam Smith versus early retirement extreme. 
And Adam Smith, if you're not familiar, he's an economist. He's famous for the invisible hand, the idea of kind of efficient markets or move towards efficient markets. The markets kind of balance themselves, the markets left unmolested, unencumbered, they'll balance themselves out, that, that sort of idea. In this specific post, this dinosaur, that's the poster, posted, it is the maximum of every prudent master of a family never to attempt to make at home what it will cost him more to make than to buy. What is prudence in the conduct of every private family can scarce be fully in that of a great kingdom. If a foreign country can supply us with a commodity cheaper than we can make it, better buy it of them with some part of the produce of our own industry employed in a way which we have some advantage. So, the law of comparative advantage tells us shoemakers shouldn't make clothes, tailors shouldn't make shoes, and farmers shouldn't make either. But ERE Renaissance Ideal argues that we should be competent in all of these jobs so we can be anti-fragile. The time and effort we spend learning multiple new self-reliant skills makes us less productive than if we focused on one of them. How do we balance the economic advantages of specialization against the fragility of interdependence? That is a great question. I'm actually really excited to discuss this with you guys. And there was a ton of great discussion going on. The first one I wanted to highlight was Jacob. And so Jacob just wanted to point out, the point is not to be anti-fragile, although that's nice too. The point is to recover inefficiencies by creating a systems design. Knowing many different things is crucial to being able to create such a design. One cannot design without understanding the components of the design. Makes sense to me. And so actually Tyler9000 went on to even elaborate further. He discusses how there's a concept in the design industry where the most desirable designers are T-shaped. It means that they have a deep level of expertise in one area with a broad level of competence in many areas. So just again, they have this deep level, this deep level of competence, but they got a broad level as well. And that's kind of, this isn't a great T, but that's where that T-shape kind of comes from. And that's a great point. You know, this hyper focus, this super specialization or focusing on a niche of a niche of a niche while it can create some really interesting depth of knowledge without having any breadth of knowledge, it can be really hard to figure out how to integrate that new learning, that new discovery into the wider world and how it is actually applicable to real life or to being implemented in real life. So anyways, I just thought this was a great discussion because it's something that we constantly bump up against as individuals focused on financial independence, retiring early. This idea of, is it better to focus all my time on saving money by doing everything myself, or should I make more money in a skill where I can easily make more than it would cost me to learn that new skill? So the idea of, should you be making your own clothes? Should you be having your own clothes? It's, it's a great question, and it's really gonna come down to a lot of personal factors, so I don't think there's one clear-cut answer. However, getting too specialized, becoming too focused on just your depth of knowledge and having no breadth, I think results in a less desirable human actor, essentially, in my opinion. I, I think it makes for a less interesting human. I think it essentially turns you into a cog in a wheel rather than this idea of the Renaissance man, which Jacob presented in his Early Retirement Extreme book. That's that book right there. Anyways, that's just my thought. Actually, there's a link in the video description down below to Amazon if you want to buy that book. I've given over a hundred of those books away already. I love Early Retirement Extreme. I highly recommend you check it out. But again, this is just my thought. What are your thoughts? Adam Smith and the Law of Comparative Advantage versus Early Retirement Extreme. Who wins or is this even a debate? Let me know, comment section down below. Finally, hold on to your hats, guys, because we got some good news. And so this good news is courtesy of Mises.org. It's a post written by Mark Hendrickson. Essentially, I just kind of want to read how the article starts for you. We are constantly bombarded with bad news. There are disasters, dangers, challenges, and woes. On the political scene, we find perpetual discord peppered with lurid denunciations and shrill condemnations. Media reports are alternatively dismaying, disappointing, distressing, disgusting, or depressing. But despair not, friends. All is not lost. Here, let me serve you a heaping helping of good news. The world is more prosperous and more peaceful than it has ever, ever been before. To those of us who came of age in the 60s, the two most pressing problems in the world were poverty and war. 50 years later, voila, there's a lot less of those two blights on the earth. So specifically, Mark talks about, let's start with poverty. In the mid 1970s, there were approximately 3.5 billion people on earth and 2 billion of them were poor and hungry. 
40 years later, there are 7.3 billion people and 767 million in severe poverty. In less than two full generations, the proportion of severely poor humans has plummeted from 5 in 9 to 1 in 9. Nothing remotely similar to this massive economic progress has ever happened before. Look at poverty in a longer term context. In 1820, near the dawn of the age of capitalism, 94% of people were poor. Indeed, throughout all of human history before then, only a tiny elite prospered while over 90% of humanity barely subsisted. At the end of World War II, there had been significant progress, but over 70% of the people alive were severely poor. Then look in 1981, 44% of humans were severely poor. In 1990, 37%, 2010, 16%, 2013, 10.7%. This is an astonishing achievement. It truly is. This is truly an astonishing achievement, guys. And let's jump over to fee.org where they actually have this world population living in extreme poverty graph. And we, you can just see the massive progress we've made as society, as the human condition has generally improved. And it's just, it's actually really awesome, guys. So I recommend you check out the foundation for economic education. Great article kind of discussing what's going on with being middle class and kind of what's actually going on with poverty. I mean, we hear about this all the time, all this negative news in the media and this bias towards negativity from the mainstream media. And the thing is, when, when something like this, when an article like this comes out, I think it's really important to actually really consume this and, and take that 10,000 foot look at the situation of what's going on here on earth because it's quite pleasant. Things are working out pretty well for most of the people and it seems like we're trending in the right direction. So while, you know, sometimes politics, we get caught up in, you know, denunciations and he said, she said, party alliances and things like that. The key to remember is we're moving in the right direction, people. And yes, well, some of the advantages we maybe experienced were due to petrol booms. It seems like we're in the process of developing technologies to help start replacing those energy needs, the energy constraints, which we might bump up against if we continue to use energy the way we are. This is just my opinion though. I'd love to hear your opinion. What do you think? Are we better off today than we were in 1820? I'd, lo I'd love to get your perspective, especially if you think things are worse because I just, I don't know how. I don't know how. What what set of facts are you basing your, your worldview off of if you think that things are actually getting dramatically worse these days? Jump in the comment section down below though. Let me know, share your perspective and share your facts because facts are facts. Well, that's it for this episode. If you guys enjoyed this episode, smash that like button, hit the subscribe button if you're new to my channel, and remember, sharing is caring. Sharing is the only way I get new subscribers, so please share this wherever you're social. Whether that's on Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, I don't care, wherever you're social, please just share. If you got value from this video, if you enjoyed this video, please share it. If you didn't, if you're not gonna share it, I want you to jump in that comment section down below and tell me, what would I need to do to get you to share these videos on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, I don't care, just share away. So let me know, what would I need to do? Would I need to call you out personally for you to share this on your Facebook? Because maybe I'll do that to one or two commenters. Re I really, I'm serious, guys. I'm super, super serious right now. I want you guys to start sharing my videos way more often. So. Just let me know, what, what do I gotta do? What do I gotta do to make you share? What do I need to do to make you share? What do I need to do to make you share this video? That's it. Until next time, remember, making money is a team sport. There's more than enough money in this world for us to all make it, but if you're not saving it, I mean like, what's the point, guys? And share, sharing's caring. Always be sharing. Thanks.